So welcome to the second lecture on quantum field theory. So today we'll be reviewing angular momentum spin and generators of transformations. So first, we're going to review angular momentum and spin. So I understand that some of you may have seen this, but some of you may, may not. So <clears throat> this is an extremely important topic in quantum field theory because um, in quantum field theory, quantum fields are classified by the spin of the particles that are associated with the field. So, so this is a central um, subject. So what is um, angular momentum or spin? So let's uh, review angular momentum in quantum mechanics. So the angular momentum in quantum mechanics is a triplet of observables, that it's a vector operator. So it's got three components and it's given by R cross P, just as in classical mechanics. So because L is a three component operator, it'll have it's actually a combination, it's actually a collection of three uh, operator LX, LY, and LZ. And LX is given by Y times PZ minus Z times PY. LY is given by Z times PX minus X times PZ. And LZ is given by x times py minus y times uh, y times px. Now, <clears throat> these three uh, relationships can be written in a concise form by saying that the ith component of the L operator, the L vector operator is given by the cross product. So that is epsilon i jk, where epsilon ijk is the Levi-Civita tensor, and the, uh, and the jth component of the position vector times the kth component of the momentum operator. So <clears throat> now we can use the fundamental commutation relationship, which is r i r j, they commute. So what does this mean? That all the position variables in quantum mechanics, commute, then uh, PI, PJ, commute. But when we take XI and PJ, we get I, H bar, delta IJ. So now we can use these to <coughs> compute what the commutation relationships R between say LX, LY, and LZ because they are quantum mechanical operators. In general, they will not commute. So it's straightforward to show using these relationships is that um, LX, the commutator of LX and LY gives me I H bar L of Z commutator of Ly and Lz gives us Ih bar Lx and the commutator of Lz Lx gives us Ih bar Ly. And these three relationships can be succinctly written as the commutator of Li and Lj is equal to I H bar epsilon I J K L K. Now to show this from uh, this definition and this and these commutation relationships, it is useful to note that if I have two epsilon tensors and I sum over one of their indices. So if I have epsilon, say, JKL times epsilon IML, so I'm repeating the L index here. That means that I'm summing over L. So there's a sum from 0, 1, 2, 3. 
Then that is going to be given by delta, the delta of ij, delta of km minus delta of jm and delta of ik. So this is very easy to show that this is true. And using this, you can prove uh, this relationship. OK, let's make a few comments. And comment number one is that you know since Lx and Ly and Lz don't commute, it's not possible to measure all of them simultaneously. This is basically coming from the fact that this is the um, a form of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Another interesting thing to note is that the square of the total angular momentum operator, so that's written by as L squared, which is the dot product of the vector operator L with itself. And of course, if we, we can write it more explicitly as Lx squared plus Ly squared plus Lz squared. Now it's easy to show that, that this operator commutes with L. So L squared commutes with L. You can, if you take one of the components of L and suppose that I take Lz, then these two guys will commute with each other. So <clears throat> this means that in quantum mechanics, we can measure the total or the modulus or the modulus, sorry, the modulus of the angular momentum which is of course equivalent to measuring L squared and only one component of L, say Lz, simultaneously. All right. So <clears throat> number three comment is that, so in quantum mechanics, there are other vector operators known as spin operators. And uh, usually they're denoted by S. So spin operators are also vector operators. So these are also vector operators. Now, what's special about spin operators is that they also satisfy the angular momentum algebra. That is, if I take the components of the spin operators and compute their commutator, then I get the same algebra as the angular momentum algebra. However, spin operators cannot be written in terms of, say, some position operator and some momentum operator. So that's the thing about spin operators, that although they have the, they satisfy the same algebra as the angular momentum algebra, of, but they cannot be expressed as you could express L. So, so the spin degree of freedom associated with spin operator is called an intrinsic spin. And because they cannot be thought of as rotation of some extended system. So if S is called the intrinsic spin, then L is called the orbital angular momentum.
So our next uh, comment is that the angular momentum algebra by which we mean some, some triplet um, of Hermitian operators which satisfy you know, this relationship is a very, very powerful algebra. And it contains with it all the information needed to derive the possible finite dimensional Hilbert space that represents you know particles of different spin or angular momentum. So what we're going to do is that by J, we are going to denote either the orbital angular momentum operator or the spin operator. So the last comment I have to make is that in quantum field theory, we choose the natural units in which C equals to one as well as H bar is equal to one. If I use this unit, then the angular momentum algebra becomes Ji, the commutator of Ji and Jj, is I epsilon Ijk J of K. So there is an H here, H bar here, but the H bar is 1. 